The turn of the century saw the Boxer Rebellions in China. Since the end of the Opium War, Western powers were able to obtain very favorable trade treaties. They carved out treaty ports, most notably Hong Kong for Britain. Even the Congo had its own treaty port. Western missionaries were allowed to preach anywhere in China. There were instances of missionaries entering Chinese holy sites and destroying sacred items. The Boxers were a secretive spiritual order opposed to the Western presence and the Christian Protestantism. They began their revolts in 1899, declaring death to the barbarians. The Boxers assassinated clergymen with the aim of driving out the foreign presence. Chinese imperial troops had joined the Boxers and the Empress ordered all foreigners to leave Beijing, then known as Peking. However, any foreigners attempting to leave were killed. Several foreign navies were sent to put down the revolts and rescued foreign residents in Peking. The Germans arrived too late for the fighting, but nonetheless decided to take punitive measures in the Chinese countryside in retaliation for the murder of a German minister. All invading forces committed atrocities, but the German troops invaded for no other reason than to punish innocent civilians. The German field marshal used the Empress's palace as his headquarters. While the winners were putting the losers on trial, German soldiers were busy committing the same crimes, rape, murder, pillage, that the boxers were being executed for. In July 1902, Kaiser Wilhelm II summed it up thusly. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited. Just as a thousand years ago the Huns under their king Attila made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German be affirmed to you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. The German atrocities were universally and hypocritically condemned. The Kaiser's reference to the Hun was taken up to refer to the Germans in an uncharitable way. The term was cemented when it was again used to describe German colonial abuses in West Africa in 1905 most frequently with the dated adjective Hunnish. Kaiser Wilhelm was also credited with coining Yellow Peril, originally in reference to Japan. He was referring to the Japanese victories over Russia in the same year. The Second Boer War was the climax of the British scramble for Africa. The conflict was the culmination of long-standing tensions between British and Dutch settlers in, uh, in Southern Africa. The British had controlled the Cape since 1814, the Dutch settlers, the Afrikaners, had nurtured a dislike for government authority. They believed that uh, a stronger line should be taken with the indigenous population. The word they would use was firmness. When the British outlawed slavery in 1833, the Afrikaners viewed this as a threat to their way of life. Very few Afrikaners owned slaves, but they believed in European domination as being right and just. Disillusioned Afrikaners began to migrate to the north to escape British imperial control. The migrants were known in Dutch as the uh, Voortrekkers, meaning pioneers, or literally Voorpullers. Trek came into English from this source, attested in 1849. They settled in the Transvaal region, building houses and farms. When the British tried to reassert control of the region, the Boers, the Dutch word for farmer, humiliated the British at the Battle of Majuba Hill, a conflict remembered as the First Boer War. The ensuing peace treaty afforded the Boers self-governance. The discovery of gold in 1886 made the region and its capital Johannesburg prosperous. The region possessed the largest gold deposits in the world. British settlers from the south migrated northward to participate in the gold rush. The Boers referred to them to these uh, new arrivals as Uitlanders, meaning outlander or foreigner. The Uitlanders eventually outnumbered the Boers. The governing body of the Boers, the South African Republic, refused to afford the Uitlanders the right to vote. They knew this would lead to the end of their autonomy and eventual annexation with the British Empire. Paul Kruger, the president, led the resistance to enfranchising the Uitlanders. Colonialists back in Britain were able to mobilize public support for the military intervention. Hostilities began when the Boers launched preemptive attacks in the Natal region and the Cape Colony. The initial phases saw victories for the Boer settlers. The Boer commandos were good soldiers, fighting for land they saw as rightfully theirs. They were supplied with various modern weapons from Europe, 
such as the Mole's arrival from Germany, a deadly weapon that was light, easy to reload, and whose bullet could rip a hole straight through their target. As farmers, they knew how to ride and shoot, therefore they were able to beat the British back. If war was really about how skillfully bits of metal are projected at the enemy, then the Boers would have won hands down. Nonetheless, the superior numbers and resources of the British eventually overcame the Boers on the open battlefield. The Boers were forced to shift to a guerrilla campaign. The business of war is considerably more horrid than the fire and flat contests they are so often portrayed to be. Enter Lord Kitchener and Lord Roberts, who were brought in after a string of defeats widely publicised in Britain as Black Week. Seeing the likelihood of defeat and to combat the guerrilla tactics of the Boers, Kitchener took the gloves off. Prisoners of war were deported to Ceylon, Bermuda and St Helena. Wells and fields were poisoned. A system of blockhouses that will total 8,000 were lined up across the entire length of the Transvaal. They spread over 3,700 miles, which is almost 6,000 kilometres, and manned by 50,000 British and 16,000 supporting African troops. The blockhouses were linked by barbed wire and tin cans, attached to alert the blockhouse sentries to guerrilla activity, and each house was connected to telephone and telegraph lines. Farmhouses were burned, while the women and children looked on in terror. These civilians were then brought to what the army referred to as refugee camps, the first of them established in the summer of 1900. Some were run better than others, some had fences around them, some didn't, but conditions were generally terrible across the board. In a rare example of an army documenting its atrocities, it is known that 26,000 Boer women and children died in these camps. The number of African internment fatalities is unknown, no records were kept. The news agency Reuters first uncovered and published the scandal, which was brought to the attention of the British Parliament by Liberal Party MP David Lloyd George. Based on this report, fellow Liberal Party members of Parliament are C.P. Scott and John Ellis first used the term concentration camp to describe these miserable facilities. The two members of Parliament derived the term from the Spanish uh, reconcentrato camps set up in Cuba from uh, 1896 to flush out Cuban guerrillas, and the term uh, reconcentration camp was occasionally used specifically in the context of uh, the Spanish internment methods in Cuba. Similar camps had also been used by the, by the Americans in the Philippines and by the Germans in East Africa. They were colonialism's most evil byproduct. Emily Hobhouse, the secretary of the Women's Branch of the South African Conciliation Committee, toured the camps in mid-1901. She then set about her campaign to expose the conditions of the camps at, at a time when there was a lot of popular support for the war. She wrote pamphlets and undertook a lecture tour. The Manchester Guardian subsequently took up the cause. The camps were eventually handed over to civilian control and conditions improved. Among the British troops were men from the Dominions. The rank and file of the nascent Australian military had already established its distinct disdain for the rigours of military pomp and ceremony. Their tendency not to salute superior officers was already on display, an infamous quality that defined the Aussie troops in the First World War. They would distinguish themselves as competent and aggressive, performing particularly well as scouts due to being experienced with horses and orienteering back home. They were the first troops to relieve the besieged city of Kimberley. They also had a well-earned reputation for indiscipline. It is the general nature of soldiers to be insolent and irreverent and the Australian variety were even more so. Lieutenants Harry Morant and Peter Hancock were executed for murdering prisoners of war and civilians. Morant's last words were, shoot straight you bastards, don't make a mess of it. They were widely regarded as scapegoats to atone for common practices in the conflict, causing much our resentment in the new federation, the Commonwealth of Australia. Efforts to exonerate the two men stopped only about a decade ago. Many of the Australian soldiers were miners before they came to fight in uh, Southern Africa. So therefore they were very apt at digging holes in hard soil. In the prelude to the Battle of Elands River, the Australian contingent used poor digging materials in hard soil to establish defensive positions, which is a fancy way to say that they dug holes. The garrison of 500 Comor soldiers came, after, came under siege by between 2,000 and 3,000 Boer troops. The defensive positions came in handy as their garrison held out 
until reinforcements arrived. Digger had been a term to describe a miner. After the Battle of Elans River, it was now on its way to being a word used to describe an Australian soldier. While the usage uh, dates from this conflict, uh, Digger didn't come into popular usage until World War I and was extended to their New Zealand counterparts. The British continued to destroy farms, livestock and food stockpiles. Just as conditions in the camps began to improve, the military stopped transferring civilians to them. With their homes and livelihoods destroyed, the destitute civilians were left to the elements and vulnerable to attack by vengeful Zulus. As the Boer fighters were raiding the Zulu territories for supplies, some 13,000 women and children were estimated to have been left for dead in this manner. The Boers finally surrendered after this brutal and cruel battle of attrition. As terrible as it was, it was a mere foretelling of 20th century war. The European powers were gearing up for something far more ghastly. The Boer War marked the end of the scramble. Winston Churchill, as Undersecretary for the Colonies, wrote in a departmental minute dripping with sarcasm. The chronic bloodshed which stains the West African season is odious and disquieting. Moreover, the whole enterprise is liable to be misinterpreted by persons unacquainted with imperial terminology as the murdering of natives and the stealing of their lands. The underlying causes of the First World War are numerous and complex. Historians still debate how it all happened. Colonial rivalry and the arms race that it caused was a key factor. Further colonial expansion was no longer possible without entering into a rival's sphere of influence. This uh, colonial rivalry precipitated a devastating expansion of industrial and military capacity. Since the Napoleonic Wars, Britain favoured a policy of splendid isolation, meaning a gold alone approach to matters of war and an aversion towards getting involved in foreign conflicts. Edward, an excellent judge of character, despised his cousin, Kaiser Wilhelm II. On the other hand, he loved France and the French, which led him to enter into the Entente Cordiale in 1904. This agreement ended a centuries of tension and resolved a myriad of small disputes. France was already allied with Russia, and Britain entered into a separate agreement with Russia in 1907. The agreement was officially called the Triple Entente, and was less formally referred to by the French borrowing as a bloc. Germany, Italy and Austria-Hungary had already formed their rival blocs, the Triple Alliance. Industrial and technological development, together with colonial wealth, laid the groundwork for a catastrophic century. The horrors of total industrial warfare were soon to reach their peak. It would bring a way of fighting that left its tragic imprint on the lives of entire nation states and people, the harbingers of death were about to set the world on fire.